So I am interested in a great many different fields, all of them somehow involving geometry. I'm interested in dynamics, which is very geometric. In fact, the visibility of these pictures in uh, complex dynamics is one of the really important features of the field. And I have an example to tell about that. There were, one of my early professors when I was at Harvard was a man called Lars Alfors. He was one of the very first, he got the first Fields Medal in 1936. He's a Finnish mathematician. And he tells me that when he was a graduate student of Lindelöf, at Helsinki, Lindelöf made him read the works of Fatou and Julia. They were the recent products of the, uh, they had received the pri prize of the French Academy in, in mathematics. It, it, it was all the rage in France. And he tells me that at the time he read, it, read them, they seemed to him like the pits of complex analysis, just the worst, dullest subject that there were, were. And that he only understood what Fatou and Julia were actually getting at when Mandelbrot and I started him showing him pictures of the phenomena that Fatou and Julia were describing. They had managed to visualize them somehow, but without computers, they couldn't really have accurate pictures. Now, if even for Alfors, the presence of pictures was absolutely essential to understand the field, just imagine what it is for other people. If you consider that Alfors was one of the great creators of many of the tools that we use constantly, yet he had not managed to understand what Fatou and Julia were getting at in their papers. I, I'm also interested in hyperbolic geometry. But actually, I have a lot of other interests, too. I have a book written in French uh, with Florence Hubert called Calcul scientifique de la théorie à la pratique, Scientific Computation from Theory to Practice. So I have a substantial interest also in applied mathematics, in uh, scientific computation, I also have a book in two volumes with Beverly West on differential equations. That's another subject which is very geometric. And I have a feeling that I made, I made numerical analysis a lot more geometric than it usually is in my book. Um, roughly speaking, any mathematics where I can visualize what it is that's going on is of interest to me. I'm not absolutely sure that anybody ever really knows why they do anything. Uh, why you do, do something is a consequence of your whole history and perhaps of the whole history of the world before you. In my case, one thing which is clear is that I was good at it. In high school, I was by far the best mathematician I knew. Um, I, guess, I guess I was also very much interested in biology. And I was very much interested in physics. But the reason for which I didn't go into biology this goes back to the days before DNA, was that I thought that biology was fundamentally incomprehensible. That you try to study the body and uh, hey, you, you can write whole books about the functioning of the kidneys and you can write whole books about the functioning of the heart and you can write whole books about the, uh, the, the circulatory system and hormones and that's for humans and then there are all the other kinds of animals and it seemed to be just some infinite collection of fascinating facts 
that were completely disorganized. Of course, the world has changed. The world has changed and the analysis of DNA means that now we actually stand a chance of understanding many parts of biology. And if I had to do it again, you never can tell what you would do again. But I'm tempted to think that maybe I would go into biology instead of math. So, one thing that I really remember from high school was the trick for summing geometric series. It's a little trick. You take your geometric sim series, a plus ar plus ar squared plus, plus ar to the nth, and then you multiply it by r, and it becomes ar plus, plus ar to the nth plus ar to the n plus 1, and then you subtract one from the other, and it all cancels out, leaving you with ar to the n plus 1 minus a. And then uh, there's a, that trick allows you to actually find this sum. It's perhaps a little bit similar to how Gauss at age five, who was given instructions to add the numbers between one and 100 by his teacher, sort of as a way of occupying them. And, uh, and he piped up with the answer almost immediately that it was 5,050. And that's because he had found the trick for summing them. Uh, you add 1 and 100, and then you add 2 and 99, and then you add 3 and 98, and so forth. Each one of these is 101, there are 50 of them, so it comes out to 5,050. 5, now, I didn't invent the... Gauss invented the trick at age 5, and I learned the trick at age 12. There's a substantial difference there, unfortunately. Still, I remember it's striking me as very beautiful that such a trick could exist. And I still teach it in every elementary course that I take. Now, that's learning. It isn't discovering. I clearly remember when I proved my first theorem. And, you know, the, the theorem was that if you have a an orientable vector bundle over an n-dimensional manifold with the fibers also of dimension and everything in sight orientable, and the manifold is compact, then the number of zeros of any section, well, counted with multiplicity, is, a, is an invariant and doesn't depend on which section you're talking about. And that is the theorem which went, went into my senior thesis at Harvard. And I'd been thinking about it on and off for several months and trying to figure out a proof. And then one day, I got it. And I was immediately sure that that proof worked. As soon as, as, soon as I'd thought about it, I didn't, didn't have to write anything down. I knew that proof was right and that it would work. Um, well, it was very pleasant. A very pleasant experience to... to, to and it, it isn't all that new a theorem in reality. Well, there were, oh, I don't know, there were quite a few people who knew it, though not with the proof that I gave. And uh, the proof that I gave has become the standard proof. Um, uh, and it's, it's fairly deep mathematically. It has to do with characteristic classes. Though the proof was the proof was elementary, consisted of cutting cutting out little balls around the zeros and taking some section and, and a homotopy argument. Uh, still, it was very nice, and it has become the standard proof. Uh, at that point, I went and sat down and wrote it to, wrote it out, and then I carried it over to my professor, who, by the way, was a great man called Raoul, B Raoul Bott. He was a professor at Harvard and, and, and a, a very influential, very, a huge teddy bear of a man. Uh, and uh, I showed him very proudly my proof. And 
he, he listened to my, uh, to my description and then he walked off into the hallway and came back and walked along the hallway and came back and said, yes, your proof is right. I can tell you something about it. So I passed my thesis with Adrien as my thesis director and the thesis was a thesis in Teichmuller theory, which uh, I don't know to what extent Adrien actually knew Teichmuller theory before the thesis. Um, it's quite interesting that Teichmuller theory is a subject which was originally written by Teichmuller, who was apparently really a great genius but he was a, a staunch Nazi and uh, he wrote his publications all in Gothic printing in the uh, Academy of, in the Proceedings of the Prussian Academy of Sciences, of which it's rather hard to find copies of it in France. I eventually did track them down at the uh, Bibliothèque Mazarin in, in Paris, but it wasn't easy to find. Um, the subject was then developed essentially by Alfors and Beers. This is the same Alfors uh, as uh, the Alfors who had thought that, uh, that uh, the works of Fatou and Julia were the pits. Uh, by Alfors and Beers in the 1950s. Uh, and they were both analysts, most definitely complex analysts and they viewed this as a subject in complex analysis. I'm not saying that it isn't, but, the, but, but, but that was definitely their view of the subject. Um, but in the Seminaire Carton 1960, uh, Grotendieck gave eight lectures and uh, Adrien Douadi was there and tells me that when Grotendieck got up during his first lecture and said, in this, uh, in this seminar and in the following ones, I will develop uh, the subject of Teichmuller theory. And Carton looked pretty, uh, pretty dismayed that his seminar was escaping from him. But in any case, uh, Grotendieck gave a completely different approach to uh, to Teichmuller theory, and in fact, I don't think he really knew about the work of Alfors and Beers. Um, I am sure that some of the principal theorems he really did not know, and he developed it completely from the point of view of algebraic geometry, or analytic geometry in some rather algebraic form, not, not really analysis. Now, Adrien must actually have known about this treatment of uh, Teichmuller theory. In any case, I had gotten to know Adrien somewhat, eh, somewhat probably around 19... Oh, 70 or 71, when he first moved from Nice to Paris, to, to Orsay. Um, but in any case, there was a course there, there given mainly by Renault on moduli problems, in the, on the moduli space of curves. And, oh, I sort of understood what Renault was talking about and the other people that were part of this seminar. But I decided that I was going to try to present the complex analytic view of the subject. The algebraists were very algebraic. Um, so I gave a lecture and he asked me a question. If, the, if Teichmuller space is contractible and it parametrizes a family of Riemann surfaces, that family of Riemann surfaces has to be topologically trivial. So, does it admit any analytic sections? And my thesis eventually became the answer to that question. 
It doesn't admit any sections except in genus 2 when there are exactly six. So, and the proof is really quite entertaining. The, the proof is, it involves looking at a finite dimensional Banach space and understanding the details of the geometry of the unit sphere in this Banach space uh, and complicated and delicate uh, asymptotic developments. And uh, Adrien really liked the thesis. He really liked it. He, went around the world lecturing uh, about the result and so forth. In particular, he w gave a seminar where Bott was present. And uh, as a result, my first job was at Harvard after, the, after my thesis. Um, so we got along very well. We got along mathematically extremely well. And uh, then I went to Harvard, and he came and visited Harvard, and uh, there was a question about Strabel differentials going, on, going around. There was a guy called Howie Maser who had just published a, a very nice thesis, but it, contained, it concerned various quadratic differentials, and he claimed that there was a, a conjecture that it was dense, and Duadi and I solved that conjecture and prove that it was correct, that they were, were indeed dense. And so I'd worked quite a bit with Duadi. So in 1978, I think it was, I was invited to Orsay as a visiting professor, and I gave a course. And now I had already been, already then I was interested in numerical methods. And I decided that I was going to try to put some numerics into my teaching. This was teaching Doug B, or maybe even Doug I, I forget, the first year and second year math. And uh, at the time, computers only kind of existed. And they definitely did not exist for the students at Orsay. So instead, I decided to try to use uh, programmable calculators which were, at that time, reasonably, uh, reasonably priced already. But you know, programming a program programmable calculator took a bit of doing. You had 50 steps of program and eight memories, and your program had to say, put this number in this memory and put this number in that memory and add them together and put them in that memory and so forth. And you couldn't really do very elaborate things. So one thing that you could fit within the uh, within the one of these programmable calculators was to try to find uh, to to try to find roots of cubic polynomials by N Newton's method. So I had the students program it. We ran it quite a bit. Now, Newton's method requires not just knowing what polynomial you're trying to solve, but it requires an initial guess as to where, where to start your Newton's iteration. To, and uh, at the time, I was very ignorant. I, I assumed that although I didn't know an intelligent way of choosing a first guess, the experts who use Newton's method every day. I mean, after all, Newton's method is one of the really basic algorithms of mathematics. I assumed that the experts all knew. And it took me quite a while to discover that the experts didn't know. And that, in fact, nobody really had any idea how Newton's method really worked. Uh, so I did, in fact, get to a computer with a uh, with a graphics output. Getting graphics output back in 1978 or 79 was harder than, it, you might, than you might imagine. But I did, in fact, manage to draw the, the solution to the question, if I start here, which root am I going to converge to? And if I start there, which root am I going to converge to? There are three roots that gives you a coloring in three or perhaps four colors uh, for the plane 
where maybe you have to put in one color to allow for other, that it just doesn't converge to one of the roots. And those were, the, as far as I know, the first fractal pictures of uh, complex dynamics. And of course, I showed them to, to Adrien. He was the person I was really visiting in France. And he also was very much interested, and looked at them, and uh, we, we tried to understand what, what we were seeing. And we did manage to understand some of the pictures, more or less. But we, it wasn't till, till three years later, when I was visiting Paris again, that we really actually, we had an extraordinary year, 1981-1982, where the number of theorems that got, uh, that got proved was just fantastic. Uh, we, it started out with proving that the Mandelbrot set is connected, and then, but it, but it went on, it became the Note not d'Orsay, two volumes, uh, filled with, and uh, in Adrien's own words, des énoncés, il n'y en a pas 10% de démontré et pas 1% décrit. Of, the, of these statements, not 10% have actually been proved, and not 1% have actually been written. And it's better now, but there still are a lot of things which we discovered back then, which we have not yet succeeded in proving. And in particular, that the Mandelbrot set is locally connected, which is still a, a big open question today. And two peoples have gotten Fields medals for partial solutions. Um, and yet, in any case, that was the beginning of that collaboration. I mean, we had already collaborated quite a bit. But that was the beginning of that collaboration, and uh, it continued until he died. Uh, he died diving off the Esterel and had a heart attack when he hit the cold water. He was uh, visiting the Esterel with three of my students. I mean, I suppose that today there must be a thousand mathematicians in the world who study primarily this subject. You could almost have a journal. But when it started way back when, you know, complex dynamics was two or three people. I mean, uh, there was Sullivan who also did complex dynamics and who proved a great theorem the same year. And I guess, in, although he wasn't ever quite a complex dynamics person, Thurston had, and Milner had taken an interest in the, the, in the field in the United States. Well, not Milner yet. Milner, Milner went, went into complex dynamics uh, after hearing a lecture that I gave at, at Columbia. And he was so impressed by the complex methods that he changed his field and decided to, to study complex dynamics, which is what he's been doing ever since. Um, I was j just, I was invited to, by Sullivan and went and gave a lecture in Columbia, I guess it was in the spring of 1982. And I told people about some of the results that Duedi and I had proved during the year. And it was a pretty impressive collection. Well, you know, it's wonderful to see your own students do well. And then it's wonderful, more wonderful, when they produce students of their own. And uh, I, it's perhaps very much, I, I am I am the proud father of four children and nine grandchildren and seeing my grandchildren grow up is one of my great pleasures and uh, seeing my grand students grow up is another one of my great pleasures and seeing the quality of the mathematics that they are doing is absolutely phenomenal I 
there have been lectures by several of them in this particular conference. And I think I would choose, well, Kostya Bogdanov's presentation was absolutely marvelous. But there were other very good ones. I, I, if I start listing them, there will be 12 or 15 or something, so it'll take too long. Now, yes, now I am immortal. Indeed, once you start having as many grand students as I have, then it's never going to end. Well, Marseille is a, it's a beautiful city, extraordinarily live. Uh, the markets are wonderful. The food is so good. The weather is beautiful. The blue Mediterranean is there. The beaches are everywhere. From the Sirm, you can walk to the Calanque de Sugiton. And the view from above the Calanque de Sugiton must be one of the great views of all time. It's, it's hard to exaggerate how marvelous the, the, uh, life is. And then again, there's the, there's the whole vie provençale aspect of, li uh, of life in Marseille. And what could be better than the vie provençale anyway? Now, on a more serious subject, the University of Marseille is really good, at least in mathematics. I don't know what it is in other fields, but in mathematics it's absolutely first rate. Absolutely first rate and right up there with the, with the very best. Uh, but there is a problem and it's a serious problem. So as a standard of comparison, Cornell has 38 faculty members in mathematics and about 80 graduate students. Marseille has 160 HDR people who are, have the habilitation to direct theses. And it has seven scholarships, at least seven scholarships given by the uh, by the Department of Education and Research. It's scandalous. It's the competition for these is so stiff. Good people are routinely turned away. Very good people are routinely turned away. And then there's the problem of foreign students. At Cornell, of those 80 students, any place between 40 and 50 are, so, are foreign. Those 40 and 50, they're going to get doctorates. They're going to go back to their countries, many of them. They are going to become professors in universities in their own countries. And the influence of Cornell's mathematics, the influence of American mathematics, they're always going to see the center of mathematics as being in the United States. Well, maybe not the Chinese. The Chinese have quite a tendency to see the center of the world in China. But, uh, but Marseille, how many professors do they ha have gotten their doctorate from Marseille and are now professors even, even in Algeria, in Tunisia, in Morocco, in, those are countries where people really speak French. At least the educational system is fundamentally French. And that's not all. There's, there's a lot more of Africa to, the, than just those. But how many professors are actually come from, from Marseille? Maybe one in each of these universities? How come? Why aren't there, why aren't there 10? Why aren't there 50? Uh, then you go to India, 
and you suggest to an Indian, young Indian mathematician that he might come to France. Well, first of all, he won't be able to get a scholarship. Well, it isn't quite necessarily true. If you work at it hard, you might be able to get one scholarship. And in fact, I did succeed in doing that. A gentleman called Kuntal Banerjee actually became a student, not in Marseille, but in Toulouse, uh, due to my efforts. But, you know, that's one. He is now a professor in Calcutta. Uh, and he's attending this conference remotely. Um, and he's no doubt communicating the value of French mathematics. But by and large, the Indians don't even really quite know where France is. They know where England is. They know where the United States is. Some of them know where Russia is. There was a time, oh, perhaps 40 years ago, where the influence of Russian mathematics was really important in India. Um, not that it's unjustified. Russian mathematics is great. Uh, but still, uh, why? France is one of the great mathematical countries of the world. Why is it that these students don't see France as being a capital of mathematics? It's largely because France just isn't represented among the faculty in, in, in India. They, they, they're, most universities don't have anybody who comes from France, but they all have people who come from, from England, and they all have people that come from the United States, and probably most of them have but considerably older factor, faculty who got their doctorates in Moscow or, or in uh, Poland, perhaps, uh, Prague. Many more come from Prague than, than from Paris. That's completely unreasonable. Now, I do not understand why the French government doesn't see it as really of interest to them to put more effort into, a, into disseminating uh, French mathematical culture. I, I really think that it is in the interest of the French government to do it. And I just do not know why it is so, so little emphasis is put on any of that. Still, th the faculty in Marseille is marvelous. There are quantities of people who are absolutely at the top, world's top level. And this is particularly noticed when you get the, CL, the invitations to the CIOM. How come people come from all over the world? Fields medalists, Abel Prize people. There's an Abel Prize people, person talking this afternoon in our, in our seminar. Uh, Uh, and these are people who really wish to visit Marseille and really wish to talk to the Marseille mathematicians. Like the, the, the faculty, just as good here as at Cornell. But the students, it's a different world. Something that people often do not realize is that mathematics is an extraordinarily collaborative subject. Many, I, I recall talking to somebody who was a psychologist by profession, and she thought mathematicians, yeah, you know, they go into their room and get out their pen, and they write, and then they think, and so forth. And she was just amazed she eventually married a mathematician, that mathematicians are constantly talking to each other. By the way, this is really as, compar as compared to historians. I have a daughter who's a historian. 
She never talks to anybody else about history. She barely goes to any, sem any, se any seminars. The historians are fantastically specialized as compared to the mathematicians. Um, but mathematics is an extremely collaborative subject. And collaborating, well, you can collaborate in the, with the members of your own university, but, and you can try to collaborate by distant, at, at a distance. But collaborating at a distance is not the same as talking to people in person. And the time when you get to talk to people in person, I mean, the, even in this conference, there are quantities of people. For instance, Misha Lyubich is actually a professor at Stony Brook. That's a couple of hours from where I live, maybe less. But in fact, where do I meet him? I meet him here. Uh, and there, there are 20 others that are in that situation. How often do you really go two hours away to go and talk about mathematics with somebody? Not so often. Uh, but here, there you are, you are with the experts. And I certainly learned a great deal from Misha Lesha, Misha's lectures yesterday. And uh, I think it opens whole new vistas into how I ought to approach problems that I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, no, I, I mean, the, having these centers and having these conferences is absolutely vital to, to, uh, to the progress of mathematics. And certainly, of course, that does help French visibility, but it doesn't help French visibility the way French professors in these universities would. The Bouillabaisse lecture was something special. I was drunk. And the audience was drunk. There was a guy there called Harvey. He's a friend of mine. He was as drunk as a lord and kept, kept making, making various, various comments, which were probably very relevant. In any case, the subject that I talked about was, it wasn't my invention, it was Thurston's invention. The problem is that most per people had learned of Thurston's result from an earlier paper, the, the, a preliminary version. Th Thurston wasn't ever really very good at publishing his results. And so this paper came, up, came out maybe 10 or 15 years after the preprint was sent out. And as a result, everybody had read the preprint and they hadn't read the paper. Well, as it turns out, the result that was in the preprint wasn't nearly as good as the one that was in the, the final paper. So what I was giving was really the version of the final paper. And uh, it came as a surprise to most of the audience who already did know something about it because they had all already read the preprint. But there was this great improvement. So there was the audience was really primed so that they would be able to understand it. And somehow, although drunk, and although the audience was drunk, they really did, in fact, learn the statement and the proof during that lecture. I don't quite know how it worked, uh, and I've never been able to reproduce it. Nowadays, if I try to lecture when I'm drunk, I do not give beautiful lectures. But that one was indeed a splendid lecture with a, a clear statement and a clear proof and good pictures on the blackboard. And I don't know how, it was, how it's possible. And good quality, I mean, very live and somewhat bizarre, but the comments from the audience that kept everybody awake uh, and a lot of laughter. Um, 
Laughter during a mathematics lecture is a wonderful thing when it happens, but it doesn't happen often. In any case, it really worked. And essentially, the totality of the people interested in the field learned that theorem from, from that lecture, rather than reading Thurston's paper. It was successful. The Bouillabaisse construction 